morning, brothers and sisters. I apologize for the late start. Shall we seek the Lord's guidance as we open his word to begin this day? Loving Father in heaven, we know of our great need of you. We know, Father, that when we walk with you, when we walk in the paths that you would set before us, that there will be times that the adversary, who is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, will choose to encumber our path. We know that you have walked this path. We know that we can have faith that you will be guiding us, that you know the end from the beginning, and that we may take heart in this. We thank you, Father, for, so for this opportunity to join together. We thank you, Father, for this that is being presented for our time. Please direct us now. Help us to see the things that you would need us to see so that our minds may be open, our eyes may become clear, that we may see that which you would have us to do. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay. So good morning and good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Uh, we are back into Joshua chapter 20. Uh, where did we leave off yesterday? About we were looking at, yeah, we are looking at Psalm 60. Not Psalm 60. And um, I think it's Hebron. Okay. No, no, it's Shechem actually, sorry. Okay. Yes, uh, <clears throat> okay, so please continue. Okay, so we've seen this here prophecy. It is actually a Psalm of David. And Psalm 60, the introduction connects it to, um, to Samuel, chapter 8, where it talks about the Valley of Salt. And uh, this is when they defeated the Edomites. And uh, the Rezessia prophecy is given at that time. So I reckon this is prob probably about uh, 60 years, roughly, before the division of the kingdom, which takes place in Shechem. Okay. So that's that prophecy it says in the Psalm verse 8, of, well, verse 6 of, of, verse, of, chapter, of Psalm 60. Yes. Now, and then verse 8 of uh, Psalm 108, it's the same sort of, uh, just the same verse, I think it's pretty much similar. And then, uh, so we have there, I will divide and shake him. And then uh, Jeremiah 41, verses 5 to 8, says that there were certain came from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria, even fourscore men having their beards shaven and their clothes rent, and having themselves with offerings and incense in their hand to bring them to the house of the Lord. So this is when Ishmael uh, meets them and then he kills them, some of them, and then some say, well, I've got some money head, and uh, he lets them to live. Well, why do you think that, the, that Jeremiah noted that they had their beard shaven, their clothes rent, and having cut themselves? Why, was, why is this important for us to know, that they also have offerings and incense in their hand? Well, uh, my thinking is, it's probably just a sorrow over the, uh, what's happened to Jerusalem and the temple. Okay. The destruction by Babylon. Okay. And then we have... John chapter 5, sorry, John chapter 4, verse 5. Um, Jesus uh, comes to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Okay. So the understanding is that Sychar here 
is the same time as Shechem. Okay. So Sychar meaning drunken or hired. Yes. Okay. And what when, in your your application here on Sychar, would it be that it was drunken or that it was hired? Which which way would we look at this at this time? Well, Jesus meets a woman by the well. Right. So I've, I've, I have had some thoughts concerning connecting that woman to Revelation 17. Right. Because you have there a woman riding the beast who drinks the blood, the saints, or drunken with the wine of Babylon. As well, um, and there in, in the Revelation 17, you get five are fallen, and one yeah. is, and then this here woman at the well, as Jesus says that you have five husbands, and the one that you have currently is not your husband, so you have like a five fallen, one is type of symbolism happening there as well. So in other words, because she'd had five husbands, which means that she had entered into covenant with five and she was with one with which she had not entered into covenant. Correct. That's, that's intriguing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm thinking then she goes to Samaria, so, or sorry, to the town, which would be Sychar or shake him, and then she gives that message and the whole town really is evangelized by her for like two days. Right. And um, my thinking here is the message, so that the people of Sychar is uh, representing the Protestants, because this is like a Sumerian, the Samaritans, Okay. So they wouldn't be true Jews. They wouldn't be the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But they could be the Protestants. That's right. That's my thinking. Okay. Um, and the message that awakens them is the message that five are fallen and one is. So I'm just thinking it could be that Revelation 17 is the message that uh, awakens the Protestants, you know, to uh, to the message of Christ or the Jews or the, you know. <laughs> well, with, with with this with this application, that would put Revelation 17 in a completely different light than than what some of the others have been trying to place it. This. I think this is a more powerful application. A more direct application. Yeah, I've also tried to tie in the uh, parable, or not the parable, but it's kind of like a, I suppose that is like a story that the Jews, the scribes, the Pharisees give to Christ it's actually the, um, not the Pharisees, it's the uh, Sadducees. And they say to Christ, you know, like this here woman, she marries her husband and husband dies and then she marries her next brother. And then he dies and then you have like seven husbands. Right. And they all die and then the woman dies. So you don't, now the woman and uh, if you're going to apply it to Revelation 17, you know, she is of the seven. Right. If, it's, if, it, if you're going to apply that, that eighth to, to being a woman, 
you know, to be in like the, the Roman Catholic Church. Right. And um, I suppose, and in that there parable of the Sadducees, it's, you, you, do, you do see like a, the eighth, in a sense, she, she is like the one left over at the end, so she would be like the eighth. And it's identifying her as being like a woman. So therefore, I'm thinking, can you tie them to Revelation 17 that that eighth will be a woman? So just has just some ideas anyway. All right. That's, uh, I think that this is something that, that gives, like I said, a more powerful application of what we were addressing here. Now, does anybody else have any other comment on this? What are your thoughts on it? You're giving an application that I had not considered, but your logic is impeccable. So in this situation, when we're looking at the five were and one is, especially where it was five husbands and the one that you are with is not your husband, the, the overarching application would be that of covenant. So I'm going to have to think about how that can apply in this situation. So, okay, the question for that, there's plenty of symbolism in Jeremiah 41 also. The priests, 80 in 2 Chronicles 26, mourning because of the destruction, 10 remnant barley and wheat, harvest oil and honey, Holy Spirit, present truth. Now that, I, I'd have to have further explanation of that. Do you have a further explanation, sister? Uh, I, I just read, read those verses and that's what sprang out at me. I'm sure there's more there. Okay. But we have been looking as, as we are going through this, we are, we are looking at portions of scripture. We're seeing a lot of other applications to what we're dealing with with the book of revelation both with revelation 14 and revelation 17. so i'm going to have to give this some thought and then give an addressment as to exactly how i how i would look at this but i think again your your logic is impeccable i can't see anything that would be from thinking that that this was wrong So please continue. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, just another note there I have that uh, Shechem's frame here, Ebal and Gerizim. Right. So you have that covenant, in a sense, being read there. Right. And, uh, so we move on to Hebron. So Kerjif Arba, which is Hebron in the mountain of Judah. So Hebron means confederation. Some say it's like a association, and Kerbeth Arba is the city of Arba, city of four. And comes we come across it in Genesis 13, verse 18. Then right. Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Okay. So that's when he moves from Haran, he comes to, uh, to Hebron. So I mean, I'm not too sure, maybe it was somewhere else but previously as well, so I'll have to check out. So Genesis 
23 verse 2. Mm -hmm. uh, and Sarah died in Kerbeth Arba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So Sarah's um, buried there. We know that. We'll read on. We'll find uh, that the patriarchs are also buried there. So it mentions in Numbers 3 verse 19 that Hebron is the son of Kohath. Numbers 13, while the 12 spies were searching the land, mentions now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Can we use that in any way at this time? Well, we know that uh, as we read on, we find out that uh, David ruled seven years in Hebron as well. Right. Before going to Jerusalem. So you're maybe saying like there are two 2520s there. All right. And you have association and the 2520s, we've connected them to the joining of the two sticks. So that's like a, a confederation. Okay. And um, Zoan, I had looked that up. That means so. So as we're looking at this from Joshua ten five, that therefore the five kings of the Amorite, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jamath of Lachish, of Eglon, gathered themselves together. So we've got five, or we're looking at this, one, two, three, four. Is that five or is that nine in Joshua 10.5? Well, you have the five kings, Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, king of Jarmuth, Blackish, and Eglon. Okay. So they have five kings there. Right. Got it. So I, th I think that would be the, the five kings of the Amorites. Okay. And the one, the king of Hebron is called Hoham. And his meaning is uh, a great multitude. And he crushed is what I have for that. Okay. So they were they were upset because the Gibeonites at that time had made the league with the children of Israel. Yes. Okay. So in other words, these five kings are upset with someone that has chosen to enter into covenant with Israel. Yes. Okay. Interesting. I'm just going back to Zoan means like um, departure or removal. Okay. <clears throat> um, just wondering whether you could tie it into the Exodus. That would be interesting if we did tie it into the Exodus. I mean, if, if that was to be the case, would that be a city that the Pharaoh following the Exodus had built? Or is it possible that this would have been built by the Pharaoh of the Exodus? And that's, that's something to look into. I just don't know how we're going to be able to do that part of it. Well, let me read it this way. Now, Hebron was built seven years before the exodus in Egypt. All right. That is intriguing. So that would be that it was built in 1540. Yes. Wow.
So it was built in the year that would be 770 times two. Um, is it not 220? Seven times 220? Right, that too. So if it was built seven times 220, that's seven times the symbol of restoration. Yes. I'm, I'm still, I'm still just shaking my head. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, I don't know if we can prove it, but uh, certainly the name's a long, yeah, a traveler, he moved tents, he loaded a beast of burden removal. So it has very much an Exodus connotation to it. It does, you're right. Um, so moving down, Joshua 14. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephnua, the Kenizzite unto this day, because he followed the Lord of God of Israel, the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron was before Kurjath Kur Arba, which was which Arba was a great man of the Anakims. And the land had rest from war. And then in Judges 1, verse 20, and they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, as he expelled, hence, thence the three sons of Anak. Okay. And then I have uh, patriarchs and prophets. Before the distribution of the land had been entered upon Caleb. Caleb, accompanied by the heads of his tribe, came forward, came forward with a special claim. Except Joshua, Caleb was now the oldest man in Israel. So that's where I get that idea that Joshua would have to be at least 86 because we know Caleb is 85 at this exactly. time. Right. And Caleb and Joshua were the only ones among the spies who had brought a good report of the, of the land of promise, encouraging the people to go up and possess in the name of the Lord. Caleb now reminded Joshua of the promise they had made as the reward of his faithfulness. The land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever because thou hast wholly followed the Lord. He therefore presented a request that Hebron be given him for a possession here had been for many years the home of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And here in the cave of Machpelah, they were buried. They, they were buried. Hebron was the seat of the dreaded Anakim, whose formidable appearance had so terrified the spies, and through them destroyed the courage of all Israel. This, above all others, was the place which Caleb, trusting in the strength of God, chose for his inheritance. So it seems to be identifying Hebron, where these here giants were, as being those who really prevented the, their faith, in a sense, who they looked upon that prevented them entering the land, uh, just, uh, just after the Exodus. Right. And then Joshua 21, verse 13. Thus they gave to the children of Aaron, the priest Hebron, with her suburbs, to be a city of refuge for the slayer. Okay. So that's, we read that in the next chapter. <clears throat> and uh, Judges 1. Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first? to fight against them. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the hand, the land into his hand. And Judah said unto Simeon, his brother, come up with me my, into my lot, 
that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him, and Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into the into their hand. And Judah went up, sorry, and Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron. So this is interesting because is this not also a, a type of a confederation where you have uh, Judah and Simeon going up again? Yes. So you have the unity of two of the 12 tribes to accomplish the, the goal, the, the commandment that God had given to have faith and go up and take the land. Very nice. Okay, um, question uh, goes back to part of what we were looking at here, uh, where had here had been, had been for many years the home of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And here in the cave of Machpelah, they were buried. So from the chat, the comment is made, Machpelah, a fold, a double, repeated, giving reference to the second angel's message. So how Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, patriarchs, had had their place of burial in this area, this is where uh, the area that Caleb had chosen for his inheritance. He went after the strength of all the other tribes of, of Canaan to take this for his inheritance. Okay, sorry for the interruption. That's fine. So, um, yeah, I'm just wondering whether, because it looks there as if Judah's taken Hebron, but then Caleb took Hebron. And uh, Caleb, he was, yeah, so he maybe just took a section of it. And then the rest of the, the tribe took the rest of it. I'm not too sure how that worked. Or is it, or is it possible that Caleb took Hebron and that he, he is now representing Judah? I mean, you, you've got a good point. So that's something that we would have to consider. Well, that's a point as well. So Judges 16. Then went Samson to Gaza, and there was a harlot, and went into, unto her. And it was told to get the Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him. For him wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night saying in the morning when it is day we shall kill him and Samson lay till midnight and rose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them bar and all and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of the hill that is before Hebron Okay, now, if we went back just a little bit, we'll come right back to what you're reading here. It's kind of an interesting thing to have to consider, but look at the map. Here's where Samson was in Gaza. Here's Hebron. In, quite a distance, isn't it? And uphill. What was that? And, and uphill as well. Exactly. So, I mean, a lot of people, when they read that verse, they're going to think that Gaza and Hebron are not that far apart. Yet, this is showing us graphically that there is quite a distance between the two. Yes. And it's, 
you know, this should have been territory within that of Judah. It's not in Judah at that time. It's now part of the Philistine territory because of the incursions that the Philistines had made. Because I believe that Gaza was one of the five cities of the Philistines in the time of the judges. It was. So this, you know, when, as you were reading this, my, the mental picture that I had was we needed to address just how really far these cities were apart. And that when you, when you figure like what you were saying, Stephen, that this was not only far apart, but also uphill, but we're also talking that Samson accomplished this in a night. That's, that's some feat. Yes, it's miraculous. Does this shock anybody the way it shocked me? Okay. Please continue. Okay, 2 Samuel, chapter 2, says, And it came to pass, after this, that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? And he said unto Hebron. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. And then in another place, in 1 Kings chapter 2, it says seven years reigned he in Hebron. Okay. So, seven years and six months, that, that would be an interesting kind of a number to look at. I mean, prophetically, if we had 90 months by 30 days, We'd be looking at 2,700, but there has to be something more into this than, than we may have thought of before. Yes. Okay. We had also, we had also seen that the building of the temple mm -hmm. was seven years, but also seven years and six months as well. So you have quite a similar situation. Okay. And Cyrus, Elmite says he ruled uh, for seven years. And then Cambyses, who followed him, she says that he ruled for seven years and six months. So you can maybe even tie in them two kings. Right. That's interesting that we would have that kind of a tie-in of, of the seven years and then seven years and six months as well. Okay. So to Samuel, and unto David were, the, were sons born in Hebron. The first was Ammon of Abinoam, the Jezreelites, and his second was Chiliab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, and the third Absalom, the son of Makkah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur, and the fourth Adonijah, son of Haggith, and the fifth Shepathatiah, the son of Abital, and the sixth Ethriam, 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 is that or? by Egla, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. So how many there? Okay, we've Six. got... Six. Yep. Six. Incredible. 
like to six wives as well. There wasn't any like one wife having two sons as well. So. And we're we're aware that at that time, you know, here the, here are six sons born to six wives. Yet he was married to seven women at that time. Because the, the daughter of Saul had no children. That's great. So does the number of David's wives being seven showing here, would that have any tie-in back with Revelation 17, with what we were addressing before? I haven't thought about it. Okay. Okay. But uh, certainly worth considering. Okay. So 2 Samuel, chapter 3. Abner came to David to Hebron, 20 men with him, and David made Abner and the men that were with him a feast, and they buried Abner in Hebron. So I've, like, uh, there's events there that take place where I think it's Joab kills Abner. Right. And then uh, I think that's yeah, so so he's buried there in Hebron as well. But it's, all, it's interesting as well that Abner, when he came to David, came with 20 men. So that's 21 men or three times seven that came to David in Hebron. Yes. Okay. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth onto David to Hebron. So that's uh, the one who was reigning in northern Israel who his uh, servants killed. I'm thinking that David would be happy with that. But David was not, and uh, he slew those who brought the head. Right. But he was buried, I think, in Hebron as well. Um, so all the elders of Israel came to the king, to Hebron, and, um, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. So like a league there, you have the name Hebron, which means association or confederation. Right. You could probably liken that to like a, being like a league. Right. To Samuel 15, and it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. For thy servant vowed a vow while I abode at Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said unto him, Go in peace. And he arose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as ye hear the trumpet, the sound of the trumpet, then ye shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. So he was being duplicitous. Yes. Okay. And then to Samuel again, I think this is earlier uh, in the verse, uh, in the chapter. Then David said, none ought to carry the ark of God, but the Levites. For them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister under him forever. And David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring the ark of the Lord unto his place, which he had prepared for it. And David assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites and the sons of Kohath, Uriel the chief and his brethren, 120 of the sons of Hebron, Eliel the chief and his brethren, fourscore. So of Uriel, we have 120. Of Eliel, we have 80. 
So there's yes. 200 that are recognized that are Levitical that would be able to bring forth the ark, right? Or am I missing something here? Yeah, I think it's the, the sons of Kohath, they don't carry the ark. And um, just looking at the number there, you have Uriel the chief. Right. And his brethren, 120. So that in total, that would be 121. Okay. Give me 121, and then, right. And then Eliel the chief and his brethren, four score. So that would be 81. And uh, 121 is 11 times 11. Right. Or 11 squared. And 81 is 9 squared. Excellent so, point. So maybe you could tie in like a 9-11 or November 9th. Okay. Excellent point. Now, when I was, when I was looking at this chapter as well, there was one verse that was tied in by the translators that I've had to really, I've had to mull over. So if we were to look at Luke 1, 39, we would see that this verse has a surprising point to make from the New Testament. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah. We know that John, John's father was a priest that served in the temple. Mm -hmm. We know that Hebron was originally where David reigned from but it was also one of the cities of refuge. Yes. And here are the, the translators are placing that Elizabeth and Zacharias lived in Hebron and that Mary left from her home to come to visit her cousin in Hebron. So is this also kind of a, a in, in a way, a joining or a confederacy where you have John the Baptist, who was preaching from the Old Testament, showing scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees of what they were not doing and should be doing, and then the mother of, of Christ coming to the, the mother of John while they are both pregnant. And Elizabeth feels John jump for joy when Mary comes. But Christ being the one that is representational of what we would call the New Testament. So we have this confederation of two or the joining of two. Does Ellen White, does she say that they were ministering in Hebron or that's where they were from? That I don't know. I'm just going off of what, what I had found initially in the notes that the, the translators had used. Right. Okay. So they're tying it to Hebron. Correct. Mm -hmm. So there may be quite a bit that we could find. I mean, we know that, that Mary came into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah. And that's the way that Luke 139 represents this. So there's a good chance anyway it would have been Hebron. Okay. Okay. So you've got quite a few quotes here on the cities of refuge. Yes. Okay. Uh, so the church is God's fortress, his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. Any betrayal of the church is treachery to him, 
which bought mankind with the blood of his only begotten son. So the church is a city of refuge. She also says every school should be a city of refuge for the tempted youth, a place where their follies shall be dwelt, sorry, shall be dealt with patiently and wisely. She says six of the cities assigned to the Levites, three on each side of the Jordan were appointed as cities of refuge to which the manslayer might flee for safety. The appointment of these cities had been commanded by Moses that the slayer may flee hither, thither, which killeth any person unawares, and they shall be unto you cities of refuge. He said that the manslayer die not until he, sh he stand before the congregation in judgment. This merciful provision was rendered necessary by the ancient custom of private vengeance, by which the punishment of the murderer devolved on the nearest relative or the next heir of the deceased. In cases where guilt was clearly evident, it was not necessary to wait for trial by the magistrates. The avenger might pursue the criminal anywhere and put him to death, wherever he should be found. The Lord did not see fit to abolish this custom at that time, but he made provision to ensure the safety of those who should take life unintentionally. So it had, been, it had been something there in the, in the custom that God kind of adapted. That speaks volumes of God's mercy. Does it not? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. The cities of your refuge were so distributed as to be within a half a day's journey of every part of the land. The roads leading to them were always to be kept in good repair. All along the way, signposts were to be erected, bearing the word refuge in plain bold characters that the fleeing one might not be delayed for a moment. So going back to what we talked about, about Samson bringing the gates and the bar from Gaza to Hebron, that's being seen as being within a half a day's journey or 12 hours from Hebron to Gaza, right? Yes, but Gaza, I think it wasn't part of the tribes. No, I, I understand that. But it was initially, but then was not at that point. All I'm trying, all I'm trying to make is the application that in order to get to Hebron, there was a road that Samson could have followed at that time that would have pointed out Hebron as being that, that city of refuge. Yeah, if you look at the map, there is uh, quite a distance to go for a lot of the time, you know, right. for half a day journey you know it's uh to go 40 miles and i suppose you could do it in 12 hours if you consider 12 hours half a day so i don't sure. know too sure whether she means six hours as in half the daylight or half the day being 12 hours she's not specific there but certainly uh i think most places you could do within 12 hours well, I'm just, we, we know from the verse that we had read that Samson took this at midnight. Mm -hmm. So being at midnight, knowing as we do that there were men that were waiting for him, his acquisition of the gates, his acquisition of the bar, his leaving the area at night under the cover of darkness with the possibility that even though it was dark, that there may have been some light from the moon 
and then making his way to Hebron is, um, it, to me, it's just interesting because of the distance that we're talking about. In the distance that the map showed. So, yeah. okay. Yeah, I think um, I'm saying some of the cities would have been uh, 40 miles, which you and you probably wouldn't be able to do in six hours, but maybe 12 hours. So I think they're, what she's saying, half a day's journey. Sure. Would probably be the 12 hours, is my th thinking. So the cities of refuge appointed for God ancient people were a symbol of the refuge provided in Christ. The same merciful saviour who appointed those temporal cities of refuge has, by the shedding of his own blood, provided for the transgression of God's law, a sure retreat, which, into which they may flee for safety from the second death. So there's, there's like another connection there in the city's refuge. There's, there's six of them, and uh, you have the Jordan River going right down the middle, and then that's typifying Christ on the cross, where you have Christ on the cross for six hours, divided between day and darkness, between light and darkness there as well. So just that symbology would fit that from that quote. Okay. Man of sin instituted a full Sabbath, and the professed Christian world has adopted this child of the, this child of the papacy, refusing to obey God. Thus, Satan leads men and women in a direction opposite to the city of refuge, and by the multitudes who follow him, it is demonstrated that Adam and Eve are not the only ones who have accepted the words of the wily foe. So there, you're, I think she's talking about the Sabbath then, as being the city of refuge. Right. And then she says, we are to exert a saving influence over those who are without God and without hope in the world. The pathway to the city of refuge is to be kept free from the rubbish of sin, selfishness and sin. So in, a sense, um, so in a sense, yeah, we are like uh, signposts. Right. What I mean, the city of refuge, I think that's the sort of context that she's, uh, the application she's making. And then she says, strongholds, cities of refuge must be built up in many lands that the truth may go forth in connection with the medical missionary work to all parts of the Lord's vineyard. So I think that's the connection of, of uh, like sanitariums to right. being like cities of refuge. I'd have to see, I didn't really add in the context there, so I have to go back and look at that. And then there was a, somebody added a, a quote in the chat. Okay. It says, I wonder whether the gates of Gaza represent Samson's sins or a cross. He had just been with a harlot and was in territory he shouldn't have been, allowing himself to be tempted. He did, however, climb a hill as Christ did. Okay. There is some, some symbology here, yes. But what, what else do the gates of a city represent? I mean, if he's, if he's taken the gates and the rod of the city... Has he not taken the security of that city?
because they can't close the gate now, they have to manufacture a new gate. And those gates are going to be miles away from them. <clears throat> so it's just, just a question and a comment. So that's my study complete. You've done well with this. There's a lot of good points that have been brought out. Okay. Now, let's, let's take a look at something else that, that came up in the chat yesterday and that, uh, that you had presented, Stephen. I mean, there's, there's some of this that, that I looked at and I'm just, I, I'm just absolutely amazed at the, the light that God is giving and that he's using you to help present. So, let's see. Oh, come on. Okay, so new share. Now. Okay. <clears throat> You were showing this as a 457 and 1938 date span, right? Yes, a date span correlation. Correct. <clears throat> so we're looking at this beginning with Methuselah's birth, the 187 years until Lamech is born, Lamech's birth to Lamech's death of 777 years, but we know that Methuselah dies at 969, and that's roughly five years after Lamech has died, right? That's correct. So we have 457 years from the death of Lamech until Isaac is born. Yes. But we're looking at this as also with the 969 multiplied by two or 1,938 years from the time that Lamech dies until 457 BC, when the decree goes forth for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Yes. Okay. Now we have the 777 years <clears throat> From 457 to the Sunday Law of Constantine in 321. <clears throat> now, we're also aware that Father Miller had the application of 158 as being Rome's League with the Jews until we come to 508 where the papacy is set upon the throne or excuse me, where, where Rome pagan itself dies, become, becomes less than it was. <clears throat> so as he was seeing it, that was the establishment of the 666, right? Yes. You have paganism being taken away. Replaced by the trans <clears throat> transgression that shall make desolate. Yes. <clears throat> so we have this Sunday law of Constantine in 321. And then 969 years later, we have the edict of expulsion on 18th of July of 1290. Mm-hmm. 
So here we have this amazing point that the Jews were given 2,520 hours to leave England in 1290. Yes. So I look at these tie-ins, especially with Daniel 12, verse 11, and have to wonder, you know, is this giving us a secondary or tertiary witness to this validity of prophecy? We had what occurred in August of 1840 that became a, a mighty testimony as to the validity of prophecy. Is this what God is doing for us now? Showing how valid July 18th really was. Yes. And um, that year, um, the 18th of July, that's noted by the Jews as being um, in the rabbinic calendar, it's not in the biblical calendar, but they, they know it as the, as the ninth of Av. Okay. They have a name for it, it's their day of disasters. It's the day when um, the, the, they, they know that day is when the temples were destroyed as well in 586 and 70 AD. Really? And then it's the day when something that the Holocaust was going to be implemented. And they have that there is one of the days as well. They connect to that same day as well. Um, there's a few other disasters. Okay. So it's just like a, a day of mourning, I think, in the Jewish tradition. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, so the biblical day when the, the temple was destroyed, we normally mark as being the 10th day of the fifth month, but the Jews, so they have it as the ninth. It's probably the temple began to be taken on the ninth, you know, it was kind of, wasn't just overnight, you know. Okay. Um, there was another diagram I added to the chat today. Okay. You can maybe look at that as well. Okay. I haven't been into the chat yet today. So. Okay. I'm seeing two. And you got one. Taking 781 BC as a symbolic date, no event attached. It was about the time that King Jotham was born. And then you've got a second one that, that shows some additions, right? Yeah, so we'll just go to the second one because it just has the same thing as the first one. Okay, so give me a moment. Trying to get this thing to open. <clears throat> I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. If you're stuck, uh, you could enable me to share the screen and I could bring it up. Okay, let's do that. I will stop my share if you can share yours. Is that okay? Got it. I see it. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, um, I notice here this midpoint is um, 781 BC. So, I'm not identifying any particular event at this year time. I'm just taking it as a symbol of a 187 or July 18. And um, I found out that it was a midpoint between when initially I found out it was from the time Methuselah was born. Um, between the time of the end, I found out this here was the midpoint, but it's, it, there's a whole other chiasm just sort of kind of came out of that. You know, I sort of looking at other things around it. Right. So we've actually gone back to uh, the 
the birth of Enoch. And we know that he's the seventh from Adam. And uh, that there ties in the 65 years then to when Methuselah is born. And then you've 187 years until when Lamech is born. And then you have uh, not counting the end date, but just counting the years between the dates. It's uh, 2,390 years then to 781 BC. And from when Lamech was born, it's uh, again, not counting the years in between. It was uh, 781 years um, to the flood. And that was in 2390 BC. So that ties in with the span of time, taking you to the, the 781 BC midpoint date. Right. Uh, going back to Enoch again, uh, the total ages of the patriarchs uh, from Adam to Jared. So if you add up their year, the years of, that they lived, so Adam was 622 at this year time. And then, so Enos, he would be, uh, or sorry, Seth, would be like 130 years earlier than that. And then you had Enos and so forth. So if you add them up, the years, the years of their lives, Jared was a, a 162. So you add up their years, it comes to 2187. So you have that there, symbol of July 1820 there, but it's kind of mixed up. And then if you add, if you, well, if you multiply two times 18 times seven, that gives you 25, uh, 252 years. And that's the time period from when Enoch was born and to Lamech. Sorry, uh, yeah, so when Lamech was born. And then uh, 777 years then takes you to the death of Lamech. And then at the end of these here, 2,390 years to this midpoint, uh, you have another 777 years to when Jesus was born in 4 BC. And then going from the midpoint, 2,390 years, takes us to 1611 and the King James Version. Wow. And then 187 years will take us to 1798, the time of the end. And then 65 years will take us to the church formed, the Seventh-day Adventist, in 1863. And that ties in with being Enoch being the seventh from Adam. Here we have the Seventh-day Adventist church being formed in 1863. So you have that symbol of the seventh being identified at that time. And of course, that's 252 years as well. So that just mirrors that uh, 252 years of the 65 and only at seven there. It's amazing. That... <clears throat> All of this is just amazing. And I just added in that, that Theodore brought out the other day that uh, 70 at 1 is 71 times 11, which is again like a mirror of 11 times 17, which gives us 1 at 7. Right. I mean, wonderful number, yes, <clears throat> but this is just amazing applications. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah, I just think it's confirming the chronology that we have. Right. That we're seeing these things, they're confirming July 18th is a symbol for us. It does that, yes. I mean, <clears throat> how can anybody choose to set aside the symbol of July 18th with all of these other 
events and symbols having already occurred? I mean, this is, is this not just a confirmation of this validity? I mean, <clears throat> when, when I was thinking about this and addressing this with some other friends this week, we accept in the words and the writings of Mrs. White that August 11th, 1840 was an example that was showing how valid biblical prophecy was at that time. I'm having to look at this again, that this makes July 18th in the same vein, just as valid as August 11th, 1840. And it places us in a way mark where with what you're showing here and what you've shown in the other two charts, that we are almost to the very close of this earth's history. That the time, the time that we have is not long at all. I mean, okay, brothers and sisters, all of this is new. All of these things are things that, that Stephen has been working on this week. What else are you seeing? I mean, are we, I mean, I'm, I am still almost speechless from what I'm seeing here, but everything logically fits. How else would you approach this? Okay. Now that second screen that, that you had done, the one that you sent out initially, do you have that handy, Steve? Um, well, it's just the same one, except there's a few things less on it. Well, what, what the one that I was talking about is the one that has the, the life of Methuselah at the bottom. The one that you sent initially this week. Right, okay. I'll have a look and see. All right, okay, I know what you mean. Yes, I have it. Okay, can you bring that up for just a moment? Yes. And I. Okay. Now, see here, when, when you brought this up with the 34 AD to 1798, we're looking at 969 years from 321 to the Edict of Expulsion from England. Mm -hmm. And then we have the 508 bringing us, of course, to 1798. There have been many that I have dealt with within the church that are trying to say that the 508 to 1798 was not valid. Here we are showing, th this chart is easily showing <clears throat> validity of this portion of applying the 1,290 days in a day for a year time frame. It's showing that 508 is the correct waymark point because we have 508 from 1290 AD to 1798 as a second witness. 
And yet we're also seeing that this 1,290 years was given a witness in the date of 1,290, with the Jews being expelled from England. And the fact that, this, that they were given 2,520 hours to leave England just adds more weight to the whole thing. So we have 321 years from the expulsion of the Jews to bring us to 1611. Just as 320 year, 321 years was the date of the Sunday Law of Constantine. So from the Sunday law of Constantine to 1611, is that also not 1,290 years? So 321 AD to 1611. Um, I've got the calculator. I think it's less or more than that. No, it's 1290. What is? Yeah. And also uh, to 70 AD to 321 is 252 inclusive years. Wow. And the thing about... Uh, so the 25 hours is 105 days, right? Right. Which is the 10th day of the fifth month, which in 70 AD is when the temple was destroyed. That's correct. Wow. When you have like a mirror here with the two years, seven years. Mm-hmm. And then that's... 187 and the 782. Yeah. I don't know what else to say. Well, what you have is you have this structure of prophetic chronology that Stephen's been illustrating by all these connections of dates and spans of time, which is based upon a, a correct chronology and is a powerful witness to Adventism in the past, but also witnesses to the present. Very much. Yeah. And so, so we have to, there's no way that we could reject these ideas, these of the, in the past, Right. You know, you can't say this is time setting or anything like that. But the thing is, it's only understood because of the present. Correct. Understood that. But it's still amazing to see this brought out in this kind of a, a manner. Mm-hmm. Now, how did you get uh, this July 18th? Because I didn't look it up or anything, but July 18th in 1290 and 105 days. Where did, where did you find that reference? Well, it's, it's part of the history on that. What I did when we were having that conversation during Stephen's presentation on tabled history, I, I went in, I wanted to figure out what, items had occurred what what events had occurred on july 18th okay well and it's quite simple uh just looking at i just because i never looked at it before so edict of expulsion according to wikipedia it is a royal decree issued by king andrew the first of england on july 18 1290 expelling all jews from the kingdom of england edward advised the sheriffs of all countries he wanted all jews expelled by no later than All Saints Day, which is November 1st of that year. 
so uh, so July 18th in 1290 is um, uh, so I'm just going to do this here yeah so that that's the period of time so they issue this edict and so that's 105 days to the end of October 31st. Um, so that's 25, 20 hours. The um, comment from the chat was that the Ottoman Empire was disbanded on November 1, 1922. Yeah, which, which technically is the 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 sultanate the turkish sultanate was abolished on that date okay so um so it's the ottoman sultanate that was abolished not necessarily the ottoman empire but i guess in some ways i guess connected with it the significant significance of that is it's it's the 11th day of the eighth month on the biblical calendar. Wow. So that's, or is it 11th day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the August 11th symbol. Um, so that was noted before. Yeah, it's Heshvan 11, so the symbol of August 11th. So you know, it just applies to Josiah Lich's prophecy as a symbol. But in the in the overall, I mean, there were so many things that had occurred on July 18th in history. Mm -hmm. And this one with 1290 stuck out because of Daniel 1211. Mm -hmm. And the important thing here, of course, is not just that some event happened on July 18th. It's all of the structure that it's connected to and those symbols. Right. So, for instance, the 25, 20 hours. And then how it fits to the prophecies that we understood in the past, the 1290 years. And, of course, you see the July 18 symbol tied up in that. And we see other, other major symbols, the Sunday Law, uh, the King James Bible, and even tying this back to the prophecy of the 70 weeks and the 777 years. And then just the symbols of uh, like 287 and 782 relating to um, the 187. So. And that the. 18th of July, that's one of the, the day of disasters that the Jews mark. So that's mm -hmm. the, the 9th of Av in the rabbinic calendar. Yeah. Now, I've never really been able to figure out why they mark the 9th of Av. I mean, I've read lots on it because it's the 10th of Av when the temple is destroyed, both in 586 and 70 AD. Um, but... And, and there must be some symbolic reason why that is prophetically, but I haven't been, been able to figure it out. But yeah, so it is one of their days of disaster, the July 18th, 1290. And that does tie to the symbol of the 10th day of the fifth month. So uh, I think it's pretty profound. It is. 95 is a symbol. Is uh, maybe you can maybe relate to midnight as well. How sense. does how does ninety five relate to midnight? Well, prophetically, it's one hundred ninety days. You have the the one hundred twenty days of uh, going to midnight cry, and then the seventy days. Oh oh oh. Okay, I see what you're saying. The half of a hundred and eighty. One hundred ninety. Hundred yeah, one hundred ninety. That's. So, like, symbolically midnight? Okay. Yeah, it's just weird that they chose the 9th of Av instead of the 10th. 
because they know it was destroyed on the 10th of Av, but they still mark the 9th of Av. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay. Okay, so any other comments? Any other thoughts? Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, there are so many things that you are showing now that are just barely coming into under our understanding. Help us today, Father. So many of these things that we need to consider are so new to us. And yet there are so many that are so old, yet their relevance has been discounted by others. Help us now. Guide us through this day. We thank you, Father, for the blessings that you are providing of the information, of the guidance with others. We thank you for those that have been able to join in this meeting. We thank you for those that will join in the meeting, watching it on video. Be with us in all things today so that we may represent your character to all with whom we come in contact. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you now and always. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.